today's webinar, this is my Rails and Trails Resources and Trail Expert Network. My name is Eli Griffin. I'm the manager of Trail Development Resources here at RTC, and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. Before we begin, I'd like everyone to confirm that they can hear me, and through the beginning slide, you can see the title of today's presentation by clicking the raise hand button along the right hand side of the screen. Okay, great. Please click the button again to lower your hand and it's raised. Today's topic is TMAP, the next generation of urban trail planning tools. My presenter is Dr. Tracy Hadenlow, RTC's former director of research and the brains behind the trail modeling and assessment platform. Tracy will provide some background on how TMAP came to be. We'll discuss the current and future tools, including the ready to use trail traffic calculator and Go Counter mobile app. We will be joined by Luke Thorstenson, RTC to be able to answer implementation of TMAP and how useful it is. Tracy has a lot to cover in a very short amount of time, so I'm going to do my best to speed through some basic housekeeping. First, as you may have noticed, attendees will not be able to speak during today's webinar. All attendees are automatically muted as they join to keep down the complex background noise. If you have questions for Tracy or Liz, we encourage you to come up with some good questions. Please type in your question on our forum. That can be expanded, expanded on the right-hand side of your screen. Feel free to ask questions at any time. We built in some time today to answer as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. If you have any technical problems during the webinar, you may enter your issue in the question box as well. I'll respond if I'm able, but your best course of action is to contact GoToWebinar's free customer support directly, review a selection of help topics, and they'll be shown on the screen. If for whatever reason you lose the webinar connection, please re-click your login link and you'll be able to rejoin the ongoing session at any time. And finally, after today's webinar, you will receive a follow-up email containing a survey asking you to rank our performance on today's webinar. For more information about RTC's Trail Expert Network, there's a link to sign up for occasional email notifications on it. And most importantly, a recorded version of today's webinar. With that, let's get started. Tracy? Thanks, Eli, for that introduction. Okay. So uh, thank you, everyone, for joining me today to talk about um, a, a deliverable that's been a long time coming. Um, RTC has spent about three years collecting the data and doing the analysis necessary to build the trail modeling and assessment platform. And I'm really excited to be sharing these new tools with this audience today. I'm going to give you guys an overview of what the platform is, um, what it's all about, and what it's for. And then today's webinar is going to be a demonstration of two of the tools within that platform. A smartphone application called GoCounter and a free web-based calculator for factoring short-term counts of trail traffic. We will have significant time at the end for questions. I'm not going to make everyone sit through 60 minutes of slides, but let's get right to it. Okay, so why did RTC decided, decide that we needed to build um, a new generation of trail planning tools? Well, um, what you see here is a screenshot from trailink.com, RTC's trail finding website. Uh, this shows a section of central Florida. And what you can see from here is that um, we, in the past, haven't really needed um, any particular quantitative tools to build trails. Um, for 25 years in this country, the trails movement has had tremendous success taking abandoned railroad corridors and other rights of way and building beautiful multi-use trails. So we can see here in central Florida, there's lots of trails. Um, we, we're, we're already building them. It's already happening. So why do we need to, why do, we need to do things differently? Well, um, in this particular case, um, in Central Florida, um, a number of advocates have come together around the concept of a coast-to-coast -coast connector, which would be a continuous off-road trail facility going from the Gulf of Mexico to the Atlantic Ocean. It's a really ambitious vision that would link communities where millions of people reside, um, but also provide really um, uh, international quality tourist experience um, and an outdoor, an incredible outdoor recreation experience. 
it's, it's truly an ambitious vision, and it comes with an ambitious price tag, which is that the estimated cost to complete these gaps would be $42 million. In advocating in the Florida State Legislature for the funds to build this vision and build the Coast to Coast Connector, we found in some of the conversations that we were having that um, it's not just enough anymore to see an opportunity for a trail and to feel that it's a great idea um, and that it's something positive. When we're talking about some of these gaps that we want to close in trail network, we're not talking about um, this is the higher hanging fruit. The low hanging fruit has already been built. And as we try to make the case for some of these additional miles of trail facilities, we're starting to run into questions of, well, hey, do we have enough trails? How do we know we need this trail? And how do we know that it's worth this price tag? Because um, if it was easy to build a trail in many of these locations, it would already be there because we've been at this for a few decades now. And similarly, in urban areas, um, this is a screenshot of the city of Seattle, also from trailink.com. And you can see that Seattle is a great city for uh, trail use, for walking and biking. There are tens of miles of trails um, hitting um, all the different neighborhoods of the city. Uh, these are really amazing facilities. Uh, it's an awesome city. I encourage everyone to check it out. Um, it includes one of the oldest rail trails in the country, which is uh, the Burke Gilman Trail, um, which was built actually before rail banking um, even got started. And so uh, how does Seattle know? You know, does it have enough trails? Are they done? Well, uh, Seattle does have a bicycle master plan with a vision that is a complete network of facilities to connect origins and destinations along key corridors. And there are still some gaps in those corridors. And those gaps are in places where right-of-way may be highly contested and scarce. And it's not enough just to say it would be really nice to have a bicycle corridor connecting these origins and destinations. We need to be able to quantify what the impact of that would be if we want to get to the point where instead of just building what's easy, we can build what's needed. And instead of just trying to build more miles, we can build complete systems. We know that we need to measure what we do because um, while we have made tremendous progress over the last 25 years by telling the great story that is trail, uh, we also need to be able to communicate in numbers. Trails are a great story. This is a picture of the Cherry Creek Trail in Denver. And as you can see, trails make people feel good. They are great opportunities to exercise and get outdoors. And they help you get from A to B. It's all there in this picture, the whole story. This is it. This is the complete package. Except that this is actually a different segment of the same trail. And in this image, we see a really different story, which is maybe not exactly the story that we're trying to tell. And so you know, we need numbers, because um, we don't want the story of trails to just be told by a single snapshot at a single moment. Um, you know, we want to be able to document what we're doing so that we can describe it accurately. And that's really, I mean, that's the trend, you know, uh, throughout uh, the transportation sector, at least, that, you know, performance management is something that's here. Um, we need to be able to measure so that we can benchmark where we are, so that we can describe accurately where we want to go, and so that we can keep track of how we're getting there. And this is something that is coming to uh, the sector. Um, it's definitely happening. And we don't want trails to be left behind. And so for all these reasons, RTC decided that it was time to invest in developing some basic tools for trail planning that are data driven. This is the basic logic model behind TMAP. Um, here at RTC, we've got this idea that 
um, it's really important not just to build trails, but to build these complete trail systems, in part because we hypothesize, we believe there is a relationship between trail system connectivity and trail use. That it's not just about the quantity of trails, um, but when we get to trails that are actually connected to each other, and that um, that those individual trails have more power together and will attract more trail users. And of course, here at RTC, we believe that trail use is valuable. That trail use is uh, a positive thing that has measurable value for individuals and for society. And that's a story that we've told many times, but that we want to be able to measure and to communicate not just narratively, but actually in dollars. And talking of dollars, you know, we want to be able to complete this feedback loop between um, coming up with an estimate for how much it would cost to make an improvement, trying to understand um, how many people would be served by that improvement, and then relating that level of service to the value of making the improvement so that we can compare the costs and the benefits and understand the return on investment that is trails. So this is our basic logic model. It's pretty straightforward. And so um, you know, we thought, wow, um, why hasn't it already been done? Well, it turns out the first problem is that nobody knows where all the trails are. So um, we don't have the same kind of data for, uh, for trail facilities. Um, that we do for other kinds of uh, linear facilities. And um, we just don't, uh, we don't have the databases. Um, and they, they may exist in some places and then not exist in other places. And then when it comes to estimating trail use, it turns out that um, you know, there's a lot of trails out there. And we have done only just a little bit of measurement of how many people are using them. And there, there's still a lot to learn about trail users. And so while we do have this little bit of data, um, we all that does is kind of give us an idea of how much we don't know about how many people might be out there using trails. Um, people call RTC all the time and ask, um, what's the busiest trail in America? Or how many people in America use trails? And we cannot answer those basic questions. We don't know the answer. And you know, while we are convinced that trail use has um, economic value, um, we don't actually really, you know, actually know like literally what that dollar value is. Um, you know, there's been some work in this area, um, looking at different aspects of the value, like related to the value of um, people getting more exercise and being healthier, or the value of people walking and biking instead of um, making a car trip that might produce emissions. Um, you know, so we, you know, people played around with these. We played around with some of those ideas in our Active Transportation for America report that we did a few years ago. But um, we don't really have any hard numbers on that. And in particular, we don't really have a replicable method for how to um, quantify that um, over and over again on different kinds of facilities in different contexts. And we also have no idea how much trails cost. I mean, it just really varies. It's so context dependent. Um, you know, every corridor is different. And it's really hard to put a precise number on that. And so, you know, when we went to get started with this, we just kind of realized that the pieces weren't there and that we weren't going to be able to, that there, there wasn't something already out there that we could just piece together in order to calculate that return on investment. And so that was really discouraging. And so that concludes today's webinar. Um, thanks, thank you all for your time. Uh, really appreciate everyone turning out. I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news. OK, just kidding. Actually, uh, the good news is that RTC made a major multi-year strategic investment in the money to collect the data that we need to start filling out this logic model. You know, the reason that nobody had already done this is just because the data needs in order to fill in this logic model are significant. And collecting data isn't cheap. And 
the United States is a big place. And there's a lot of different things happening on different trails in different places. And it's, it's a major undertaking um, to try to measure it. And so RTC went about it one step at a time. Honestly, we didn't really tackle the proposed trail cost estimate piece. This is something that we talk about a lot here at RTC. And we said, you know what? Just say it's a million dollars. Just say it's a million dollars a mile. It's probably not. It's probably way less. but. This is not a piece that we're going to worry about. It really does depend on the corridor. Worst case scenario, million dollars a mile. We'll just kind of we'll just kind of draw a veil over the rest of that for now. But at least we do we do actually have an estimate, even if it's not a very precise estimate. And then when it comes to um, understanding trail system connectivity, you know there have been huge leaps and bounds of progress in the last ten years in how we understand this. Um, we've got geographic information systems now. And we have uh, GIS technology that has really changed what um, an individual analyst can do in terms of looking at a system, analyzing it, and understanding it. And so the first thing that we did as part of TMAP was we developed a GIS, an ArcGIS desktop extension called Bikeable that is a tool for analyzing the connectivity of bicycle facility networks including both trails and on-street facilities. This is not the topic of today's webinar, but I just wanted to let you guys know that this is a tool that RTC has developed that's complete, that's out there, um, that RTC is bringing into practice. And that's how we address this piece. So that's one tool within the platform. Today's webinar is going to be about estimating trail use. And this is what we're going to spend the rest of our time on. In a future webinar, we're going to talk about economic impact. RTC is in the final stages of developing the final tool in the TMAP platform, which will be um, a calculator for estimating the, um, the value in dollars of trail use. So stay tuned for that. Stay subscribed to the Trail Experts Network and look forward to this tool in an upcoming presentation. But we turn that frown upside down. Through TMAP and the multiple tools in this platform, we believe we will be able to get to return on investment for individual trail facilities. And that's something we're really excited about. OK, let's go ahead and actually start the webinar now so that we can learn about how to estimate trail use <laughs> now that you have very patiently borne with me through that introduction. OK. So for the rest of today, we're going to talk about trail use and how to estimate it. What you see in this picture is a device that has been installed on a trail. This is not for estimating trail use. It's for measuring trail use. So um, there's a wooden post on the side of the trail that has a passive infrared sensor in it. And then there's a embedded loop in a diamond shape in the surface of the trail. That's an inductive loop that is uh, detecting the metallic mass of bicycles and counting those. So this is one way to find out how many people are using your trail. Um, you can just measure how many people are using the trail, and then you would know the answer. What today is about is if you don't have $6,000 and $600 a year in maintenance per trail location to buy that kind of equipment and put it out there and keep it out there and get the data from it, if you need to know how many people are using your trail now and you don't want to wait to measure it, if you just want to get an estimate, an approximation, and if you understand that even if you did measure it, that there would be problems with that measurement, even after spending all that money, that equipment breaks. Sometimes it doesn't work. Um, and sometimes uh, it's vulnerable out there in the world. And that's something that you would always have to be dealing with for every piece of equipment you were trying to use. Then you have come to the right place. What we're going to talk about today is just how to get minimal data and do some math and come up with a rough estimate of how many people are using a trail. So short-term counts, you know, I think many of the people 
on this webinar will recognize themselves in this photo. Okay, many of us have been there. We've been here either as coordinators or as volunteers. We have gone out to a trail and stood there with safety vest, visor, and clipboard in hand and just actually counted how many people we saw. I stole this photo from the FHWA website, by the way, just in case anyone from FHWA is on the webinar. Thanks for the photo. So, uh, you know, this is one way to find out how many people are using a trail. You could actually just go there yourself and observe the trail and count them. And many people do this as part of something called the National Bicycle and Pedestrian Documentation Project that's run by Alta Planning. So this project has been going on for years now in the United States. Many communities have been participating in it annually for many years. And this has become how they're measuring um, usage of facilities and how they're measuring overall levels of walking and biking. And basically, the way that it works is you, um, you get labor, you get people to go out and do the counts at locations. You give them these count forms. This is a, this is a screen line count form. There's also an intersection count form. And uh, people go out there and they just tabulate. They just like you know make a little check mark on the piece of paper every time they, every time somebody goes by. And typically they go out and observe a two hour period. That's what's typical in the National Bicycle and Pedestrian Documentation Project protocol. Um, in part because, you know, there's really only so long one person can stand in one place counting before they're going to need to go to the bathroom or there's going to be an issue with the weather or they're going to get tired. So, you know, there's, there's limits on, on how much can be accomplished through a manual count. But two hours is, is doable. So that's, that's what's in the instructions on the NBPD form. And so basically, you can get people to go out with these forms. You can get them to tabulate them. And then you bring the forms back to your office. And then they're in your office in a big pile. And that's where they are. So um, in an attempt to try to make it a little easier, to collect short-term manual counts, rails to trails has developed a new smartphone app called GoCounter. This is a smartphone app that basically just exactly replicates what the piece of paper in the National Bicycle and Pedestrian Documentation Project does. Um, it's, it's not a very fancy app. It's pretty simple. Um, but the idea behind it is what it does is it reduces the need for uh, it simplifies the data, the data entry um, associated with collecting manual accounts. So right now, when someone goes out with this form, there's data entry happening, right? They're making tabs on, on the form as people are walking by. And then they hand the form over, and then there's, the data entry has to happen again to copy the information from the form into some kind of spreadsheet or database. So um, you know, having to repeat that data entry introduces the possibility of error. It means more labor, um, and it's you know it's just it just increases the cost of the effort, and it increases the friction in between you know kind of the idea behind getting the data and then the opportunity to actually do something with it. So basically, the idea behind this app is just to reduce that friction and just try to make it even easier to collect short-term counts. There are other smartphone apps out there that you can use to do the same thing. Ours is the only one that is both free and that provides a cloud-based server that um, will hold the data that you collect on your smartphone. So um, our app works even if the device that you're using to do the count does not have a cell phone signal or Wi-Fi at the moment. Ours is not um, you know, a, a web-based application. So you can go to a trail location where there may or may not be, you know, cell phone reception or Wi-Fi or a, a data connection. You can just use the device statically to, to collect the count, and then whenever you get back to a signal, you can upload the count from your mobile device to the cloud and then um, log in to the server at a later date in order to um, get the data in a spreadsheet form. 
So I'm just going to walk you guys through um, how it works. This is a free app, and I encourage anyone to just just go to this website and then like follow the links to the Apple Store or to the Android app thing. And you know, like feel free to just download it and play with it. But I'm just going to show you a few screenshots just to give you an idea of like whether you want to do that and 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 what this app does. Okay. So this is what GoCounter looks like. You do need uh, you need an account in order to use it. The accounts are free. They're maintained by Rails to Trails. This is just so that we have a way to connect the stuff that you collect on your mobile device with the stuff on the server. So whatever you put in here on the mobile device, it's the same thing that you'll put in later over at Rails to Trails.org in, in order just so that you can get your data back. And one nice thing about that is it means that you could provide the same credentials to, like, let's say you have 40 volunteers working with you um, to do short-term counts at different locations. You could provide the same credentials to all of them. And they can all log in with the same credentials, do counts, they'll all get uploaded to the same account on the server, and then you can harvest all of that data in a single pass. So the accounts are free, and we're not trying to stalk you with anything about the account. It's just so that um, we can reconnect you with your data um, after you've collected it onto the mobile device and uploaded it to the server. Okay. When you log in, uh, you may see a screen like this. You may not. The app does try to use um, the internal compass of uh, the mobile device if it has one. And this is just so that we can record the direction that the person making the observation is facing. Um, you know, so that later on, um, if you were counting at an intersection and observing turn movements, that you can figure out who was turning from where to where, et cetera. So um, it's not required that the mobile device have an internal compass, but if it does have one, the app will try to use it, so you might see a screen like this. You may have seen this with, with other apps, I don't know. Okay, but this is what, this is what, like, the main page, when you're going to go do a count, this is the main page you're going to see. You go to the location where you're going to count. You can describe it with a name. If it's a location where someone with your credentials is logged in, if it's a location where someone with your credentials has counted before, you can save the location by name and then you know choose them. So you can say like, well, you know, I've already counted at uh, at a location, and so I'm gonna. Uh, I'm going to go back to the, the location that I already gave this name. The app supports screen line counts, which is what's selected in blue here right now. Intersection counts, including turn movements. And it supports both four-way intersections and three-way intersections. So those are the kinds of counts that you can do using this app. The app will allow you to count bicyclists, pedestrians, or both at the same time. And it does not do stuff like helmet or gender. Of, uh, it doesn't do attributes of the um, travelers that you're observing. So that is one difference between the way that some people do um, National Bicycle and Pedestrian Documentation Project type counts. This is just for traffic monitoring. So this is an example of me filling out this splash screen. I'm entering a location name. I'm saying I'm going to count. This is just you know for my own internal use. Um, you know the you can put whatever you want in for the location name. It, that's not a criteria that's being tested against anything. It's just that you can save the location for later. I'm saying that it's going to be a T-shaped intersection, and then for T-shaped intersections, in order to complement the compass direction, so that someone looking at the data later can actually figure out like where on the T-bone you were standing and which way you were facing, you have to indicate the red dot is like you and you have to pick like, where where you were standing. So in this case, I'm saying I'm standing on like the far side of the T-bone, like watching people come into it. Um, I'm describing this as a trailhead. Um, so for anyone on the webinar who's familiar with the District of Columbia, like imagine I'm standing on the Metropolitan Branch Trail and I'm watching people enter the trail um, from the Big Lots parking lot. Um, but also people are passing me on who are already on the trail. And I'm going to count both cyclists and pedestrians. 
So I just enter this basic information about what it is that I'm doing. And all the way at the bottom of the screen, you can see a little icon of a satellite. All that says is the app is also recording uh, my latitude and longitude so that someone later on can say, like, oh, yeah, Metropolitan Ranch Trail at Rhode Island Avenue, that's totally where she was in these quick coordinates. When you start the count, um, you're given a splash screen that gives you basic directions on how the app works. Um, it works by swiping. So the app is recording both the mode and the direction of each tra trail user that you're counting. And so you do that by swiping. And that's all that this splash screen is trying to tell you. So you can set the app so that you never want to see this again. Like Once you've used it a couple times, you're probably not going to need to see this anymore. But um, this is what the main screen that you're going to interact with while you're doing a count is going to look like. So it's showing you a T-shaped intersection. And you basically put your finger on top of uh, the mode that you want to count. So like, let's say I'm standing at the bottom of the T-bone, and I see a pedestrian um, pass me uh, who's already on the trail. I would just put my thumb on that pedestrian, and I would drag my thumb in the direction that they went in a swipe. And the app provides both tactile and audio feedback to indicate that, it, that, you, that the swipe worked and that the app could understand what you were doing, and it actually logged it. So the, the audio feedback is that when you count a cyclist, the app will go like, ring, ring. And when you count a pedestrian, it will go whoosh. Um, I guess that's someone walking by you really fast. In my general experience with the app, when you're outdoors, it's often hard to hear the audio feedback. Um, it can be helpful to have you know, if, if you can't hear it. But if there are trains passing you, if there's traffic, if, if it's just a noisy day, um, the app also provides tactile feedback in that the, your whole mobile device will buzz if the swipe doesn't work, it'll kind of, it'll just like it'll like vibrate and just let you know like um, that you need to re-swipe because it didn't catch what you were trying to do. There's also a running tally in the upper right hand corner. Um, right now, you can see I haven't counted anything. I've counted zero pedestrians and zero bicycles, even though I've been standing here for six whole seconds. And uh, you can look at that running tally in order to you know, check and see, like, hey, you know, is this recording the, the swipes that I'm trying to record? You can also look at that, and you can see, like, oh, oops, I accidentally logged a pedestrian when I meant to log a cyclist. Like, if you see that pick up and it isn't what you wanted, there's an undo button. Um, this is to try to provide, you know, a feature that the paper forms have, which is that anyone who's ever received a bunch of these paper forms from a volunteer knows there's going to be some scribbles. <laughs> On it, there's going to be some scratch outs from someone who like accidentally made a tick mark in the wrong box. So this is the equivalent of that. You can you can undo and replace anything that you might have done with with another count. Once you've patiently stood there for two hours or whatever the amount of time is that you're doing, you hit the end session button in the bottom right hand corner. There's also an opportunity for um, the observer to indicate whether there was precip any precipitation during the observation period. And then there's a comment box where you can write anything you want. This is just like a, a notes box. That's just It's just another tool for people who are using the app to just like help you manage data that's coming in so that you can later on figure out like which file is what. So you can write anything you want in that box including just leaving it blank. Your sessions are going to be saved on your mobile device. So if we go all the way back to the original screen, in the upper right-hand corner, you see there was a button called Sessions. You'll be taken here automatically every time you finish a count, in case you want to do another one. But if you want to look at your session, they'll always be here waiting for you. You can see that when I was preparing for this webinar two days ago, I collected some data. And what the little cloud with the check mark tells me is that my phone obtained a signal and was able to upload this data that I counted to the cloud. It's there. It's waiting for me in the cloud. In fact, it's literally waiting for me at the web address that you see at the bottom of the screen, rails.org slash membership slash manage account. 
So no need to write that down. It's there in the slides. And also, if you go to rails2trails.org slash go counter, there's a link to it there as well. So I want to go to there. I want to log in. And I want to get all those swipes that I did. I want to get them so that I can do something with them. So you go and you log in with the same credentials that you used in order to use the app. And there we go. Tracy Lowe was here on you may note that this says I was here on the 17th at midnight. I was not. The answer is that um, all of the timestamps are in GMT. <laughs> They're all in a constant time zone. So you need to know which time zone you're in and then subtract off from GMT. But at midnight GMT, uh, I did this count, and the data was uploaded to the server. And I can now download it in one of two formats. The first format is indicated here as TMG. That stands for Traffic Monitoring Guide. And that is a summary format. If you download that, it is a spreadsheet with a single row. And in that one row, there is the total uh, that you observed during that count session. It's just a summary of what you did. Or you can download the actual raw data. Every single swipe, every single observation, timestamp with the direction of the swipe and the mode that was selected in the swipe. And then you can do whatever you want with it. It's the raw data in a comma-separated file that can be opened in Excel or anything else. So the idea here is just that this is a way to do short-term counts and to learn a little bit about how many people are using your trail without having to copy things off of people paper. Instead, all you have to do is have a mobile device. If you want more information about exactly what's in those files and what they look like, there's a lot of that on the RTC website. I'm not going to make you sit through it right now. OK, so you may be thinking now, that's great that there's this smartphone app that you can just go out and you can just manually observe how many people are using your trail. But this guy has a pretty good point. His point is there are 8,736 hours in a year, and he doesn't want to have to stand there with that safety vest and that clipboard for all that time counting trail users. He doesn't want to do that. He's not available for that. So how does the existence of this app or the paper forms or anything actually really help us find out how many people are using trails? This is starting to get really frustrating. Right? Because we know that we don't have this problem with roads. For any road, it somehow just seems that there's available, just like they just say, like, oh, well, there's like, you know, this many tens of thousands of vehicles per day using this road. Like, how do they just know that? How are they able to know that for every single road, and yet it's so hard to find it out for a single trail? The answer is that. Um, the Federal Highway Administration, in cooperation with State Departments of Transportation, are running a national program to do traffic monitoring on roads and find out how many people are using them. But they're not literally standing there counting cars on roads. They're also not literally putting out those pneumatic tubes or whatever, you know, those things that cars drive over. They're not putting out um, monitoring devices on every single road all the time either. In fact, if you you know, poke around in any DOT website, you'll find a page like this. So you'll find you'll find this phrase, seasonal adjustment factors. And you say, oh, OK, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. These factors, they're used to adjust short-term traffic counts. Oh, OK, so they just collect a little bit of data. They just collect a short-term count, and then they adjust it. And that's how they get an estimate of average daily traffic. It's just math. Great. You know, like, this, that's pretty straightforward. Actually, you can just literally, like, I went to this website, and I was like, ooh, the factors are just right here online. Pretty straightforward. <gasps> Scream. You know, this, these are what these factors look like. I'm going to protect you from that right now. So there's seasonal factors. What, right? Somebody already spent, apparently, like three years observing traffic volume for all kinds of days of the week and whatnot. Somebody 
observed a ton of data, and then created the factors so that you don't have to, so that you can just do a short-term count. That's what's important to know. And that was a huge part of them continuously throughout the season. These are those ones for cars that are from counts in order to produce manual estimates. So that's how the sausage is made for cars, and that's how we're going to make it for trails, too. So it's that simple. On RTC's website right now, we have this free calculator that will apply the seasonal factors that we've created for uh, trail traffic. You can apply these factors to your short-term count and have your short-term count adjusted into an annual estimate. So the idea is that you can take traffic monitoring data that you've already collected. Perhaps you did it using our smartphone app, GoCounter. Perhaps you did it using the National Bicycle and Pedestrian Documentation Project piece of the paper. Maybe you did it your own way. It doesn't matter. Maybe you even had a, a device, but you, only, you just collected uh, 24 hours or 48 hours, or one week, or two weeks, or two months worth of data, anything less than a year. You collected some shorter term amount of information about trail traffic, and now you want to factor it to an annual estimate. That's what this calculator does. Okay, And this is the entire calculator right here. It doesn't require a million inputs. This is it. Okay, You need to indicate the region, as I think hopefully everyone on this webinar knows. Um, you know, trail use is a little different from vehicular travel in that um, we know that walking and biking, are, that weather is a significant driver of walking and biking and that the seasonal and climactic variation in walking and biking, um, there's, there's a lot more variation by season and by climate. Um, you know, and you don't necessarily see that kind of variation um, for vehicular traffic. Okay, and so we did divide the continental United States up into, well, we didn't do it. The Department of Energy had already divided the United States up into climate regions that are a function of both um, average maximum temperatures and humidity. And we, create, we have a separate set of seasonal factors for each of these climate regions. So in order to use the calculator, you need to pick a climate region that applies to the data that you're trying to factor. And we provide you this map so that you can see where the Department of Energy thinks that your community fits. But this is a free online calculator. You can play with it. You can put your data in and choose one region, and you can see what the estimate is. And then you can put your data in and choose a different region and see what the estimate is. All it costs is an extra click <laughs> in order to try out the different climate regions and see how it affects the way that your data is factored. Um, this calculator is transparent, and you can you can click around in it as many times as you want. You can use the calculator to factor bicycle counts, pedestrian counts, or mixed mode counts. If you have a short-term count that separately logs, bicyclists, and pedestrians, we encourage you to factor each of those separately. But if you use, if you just counted, if you just tallied them both on a sheet of paper together, or if you used an infrared device that just does a mixed mode count for a short term count, that's okay. There are mixed mode factors you're choosing. That's what you input under mode. You just choose one of those three. And then you just upload a file with the, the short term count in it and hit calculate. It's that simple. So now I'm going to show you an example where I'm going to factor this count. Okay, so what do we have here? This is a 12-hour count. Okay, this is 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. on my husband's birthday on a pretty busy trail. I didn't literally go to a trail on my husband's birthday and stand there for 12 hours. I just made this data set up. But this is illustrative. Okay, there are trails like this actually in the D.C. area. This would be comparable. To, this is a pretty busy trail. This is like maybe what it's like on, um, you know, uh, the Custis Trail, per se. Um, you, you, these, are, these are typical volumes that you, you, might, you might stand on the Custis Trail for 
for an hour during rush hour, and, and totally like more than 100 trail users would pass you. And this is a mixed mode count. Okay, we're going to say that this is this was a mix of bicyclists and pedestrians, but they're just mixed together in these buckets. The data is organized, and in fact, always must be organized in this calculator so that each row in the file corresponds to one hour of observation. So here we are. I've organized my data into these hourly buckets. I'm ready to go. I've got it in this weird timestamp format in a spreadsheet. I upload it, and I hit calculate, and this is what happens. Okay? The calculator is going to give you a result. It's going to say that the average daily traffic on that trail, given the data that was inputted, is 1,203.19 trips. Obviously, there's no such thing as .19 trips. Maybe I should change this so that it doesn't have decimal places. But anyway, it's going to say 1,203 trips, and it's, and it's just an estimate. And the calculator is going to indicate to you that it's, it's just an estimate because it's going to show you a range. It's going to say, OK, listen, you only observe 12 hours on this trail that's out there all the time, and you're asking for an annual estimate. It could be less. It could be more. But the estimated range, as you can see, the annual traffic estimate range is between 280 and 562,000 trips. So uh, in order to convert that um, annual traffic estimate range into a range around the ADT, all you would have to do is divide the bounds of the range by 365. Okay, but that was my, the annual traffic estimate for that trail at that location would be 439,164 trips. And so that's the estimate, but it could be as low as 280, could be as high as 560. Okay, so it's just a range, and the range depends on the length of the observation period. And this kind of makes sense, right? The more observed data you have about your location, the more confident you're going to be able to be about an estimate based on that location. And that's what's shown in the table on the low right. You'll be given this table every time you run the calculator. All this does is show is that I could have done a two-hour count. Instead, I did a 12-hour count. And that actually doesn't improve the accuracy <laughs> of the estimate that much. The estimates start getting way better when you have more like a week of observations. And I mean, even better would be like a month. Um, here at RTC, we often do as much as two months when we're trying to give people like a gold standard estimate. So um, that's, I mean, that's, that's the bottom line. You know, you can take a two-hour count and put it in this calculator, and you will get an estimate with a range. It would be better if you could put in like a month. But put in what you got and get an estimate. This is where the calculator is. I'm not kidding. This is where the calculator is. I'm sorry. This is the web address of the calculator. Obviously, no one is writing this down right now. You will be able to get this from the slides later. This is not linked anywhere on the RTC website. You can only get there by literally typing this in. I'm sorry. I'm not kidding. This is the address. This will be emailed to everyone who is in the Trail Experts Network. This is how our website works right now. This is an area for improvement in the future, but right now, this is where the calculator is. So that's, that's really it. And I'd like to conclude just by thanking everyone who worked with us to develop the factor calculator tool. We worked with Greg Lindsay, who I think many people know as an expert in trail traffic monitoring and modeling, and a graduate student at the University of Minnesota named Eric Anderson. But we'd also like to thank all of the partners around the country that helped us establish those 50 trail traffic monitoring stations and then maintain them over time so that we could get the data necessary to create these seasonal factors that already exist for other modes so that we could create them for, for trail and for our modes. We are really appreciative of these partners. They didn't get anything <laughs> in order to um, 
to help uh, establish this network. They did it because they wanted data, because they wanted the factors, because they care about trails. And so we are really appreciative of these individuals and their agencies and organizations because if they had not partnered with RTC, developing these kinds of tools would not be possible. So thank you to each and every one of these individuals, agencies, and organizations. And with that, let's take it to questions. Yes, thank you so much, Tracy. I do want to apologize for our earlier audio issues. Uh, I hope that you are able to fully hear Tracy's presentation. But just to reiterate, we're joined here by Liz Thorstensen, RTC's Vice President of Trail Development, who can answer any questions about the future implementation of TMAP and how RTC will handle interactions with the platform going forward. So it looks like we got a ton of questions about GoCounter. So Tracy, just to start, um, Daniel Snyder here wants to know if an agency can use one account with the app for multiple simultaneous counts in various locations. That's a great question. First off, Daniel Snyder, thank you. You are one of the people that we want to thank um, for helping us get to this point with these tools. Daniel, I know you've had a lot of other questions for me, um, you know, over the years about like, well, how are we going to QAQC this data, and then how are we going to do these factors? I'm totally ready to answer all those questions for you, so let's correspond offline as well, because as you can see, we finally got to the point where we cleaned up all our data and did something with it. Um, but the answer is yes. Um, the credentials can be used on multiple devices at the exact same time to do counts. We have tested that, and it actually works. And the great thing is that if you give instructions to your volunteers and you say, like, can you write your name in the notes section, or you know, can you write the name of your location in the notes section, when you go and log in to download the data, whatever they write in the notes section, you may have seen it on the screenshot that I was showing about that, you know, whatever they write in the notes section, that's what you're going to see right there on the screen. So like I had a volunteer, for example, that wrote, I saw a, one guy walking 15 dogs presumably because they were just really excited that they saw that. They just wrote that in the notes section. But every time I log into my account now, I see that note, and it, and it makes me a little happy. OK, great. Another question from Jeff Steele, uh, who wants to know if, if adding additional demographic data to the app could happen in the future, such as uh, age or gender or things of that nature. That's a great question. And you know, I get questions about this all the time, because the app is really basic. and you know, one of the reasons why people do manual accounts, um, you know, instead of just using equipment, is because they want to collect these other attributes. Um, RTC doesn't have plans to do that right now. Right now, the app has been developed. It's completely free, and it's something that RTC just developed and is just giving away to just advance the movement and get more data collected. And, you know, the user interface is, because it's a swipe-based interface, the more stuff you try to squeeze in there and the more complicated you make it, the harder it is to use. So we don't really have the resources to invest right now in coming up with an interface that can do more things. It is, of course, technically possible to modify the app to do that, but RTC is not in a place to do that right now. Great. And our friend Heather Deutsch um, has a question about the trail traffic calculator. And that's uh, whether the calculator can be used for counting or predicting annual use in a bike lane or sidewalk. Great question. OK, so obviously the app, you know, when you look at the configure, like it does screen line counts, it does intersection counts. Obviously, like, that, it doesn't have to be on a trail, right? So like, I was referring to GoCounter as something for doing trail counts. You can use it to count anywhere you feel like it. <laughs> Don't let me tell you what to do. However, the factor calculator, is based on seasonal factors from this nationwide network of 50 trail traffic monitoring locations. Okay, All of the traffic monitoring locations were on separated, off-road, multi-use trails. Not mountain biking trails, not cycle tracks. Just separated, off-road, multi-use trails. We did have a little bit of diversity of surface type, but you know, that's, that's the caveat. These seasonal adjustment factors are from, were created from a data set that is exclusive to trails. 
it's a free online calculator. Anyone can use it to do anything, actually. I mean, I'm not going to come to your house and, you know, look at your browser history. You know, but you need to know, you know, where the factors came from because that strongly suggests what they're good for, which is the intended use of this calculator is for factoring traffic counts on separated off-road multi-use trail. Great. Our next question might be one where Liz can jump in. Brian Rooster wants to know if RTC uses the data associated with the GoCounter app for our own research and whether the app uses location when collecting data to geolocate count. That's a great question. Okay, that's actually two questions, so let's answer the easiest one first. The app does record your location when you're doing the count. It records it once at the beginning of the count. So, you know, if you stand there and like log and then you start like walking around, I don't know how great that data is and, you know, the location information is, is only, it's only for the beginning of the count. And yes, all of the counts that are recorded through anyone's go counter are uploaded to a server at RTC. There's no current research going on at RTC right now to use that data. It's not impossible to think of like some ideas for how maybe there's some things we could use it for. And um, if you, when you go to create an account and download GoCounter and use it, if you look in the fine print, you'll see that RTC does reserve the right to like look at your data and maybe use it for something else. So, so that's out there, but there's there's nothing already going on about that, and I I don't I don't I'm not aware of any plans. You know that's that's that would be kind of a bit of a hypothetical. So um, it's, it's something to be informed about. It's something to know about. Um, but it's not something that uh, is happening right now. Great. John Hopkins submitted a question via email before the webinar, and he wanted to know if uh, you think TMAP, the TMAP tools could be useful in a small town or rural community, or whether they are exclusively beneficial for urban. That is such an important question, and thank you for asking that. So, in general, um, the TMAP uh, development process was really focused on urban trails, and that's for a couple reasons. Um, you know, one, most of the United States lives in um, urban and suburban areas, and two, um, as we look at what's happening in the country with trail development, we're finding that many of these more challenging trail development um, context, you know, where uh, where we're having these conversations about, well, what's feasible versus what's needed, um, you know, what can we afford, um, you know, do we have enough? We're finding that many of these conversations are happening with the more urban trails, and so that's why we focused our tool development on that. Um, all of the data, all of the traffic monitoring locations were located in urban and suburban areas. They're not all in like downtowns or whatever. We, you know, we have a, we have a good range from center city out to suburb, but these tools are generally not applicable to rural areas. That said, go counter, obviously, use it anywhere. You know, if you need to do a short term count, go counter is totally flexible and you can take it anywhere you need to go. And that is one of the reasons why we designed go counter to work offline. Like even when there's no data signal. It's not, it's not an online based platform. You can take it anywhere and do traffic monitoring. Okay, I think we have time for just one more question. Uh, Tim Blagden wants to know if there's an adjustment factor for surface type. So pavement versus crushed stone or any other type. Yeah, that's a great question. And the answer is no. Um, we don't have, we have played around. Obviously our data set at this point is so large that we are getting to the point where we could add more inputs to the calculator and and you know make more iterations on the factors and, and tweak. Uh, we've played around with not necessarily a surface type but like a like a, a kind of a trail type variable that gets that, you know, the user population and like the mode mix and you know uh, the dominant trip purposes on the trail. We, we've played around with that kind of thing and I think the calculator will evolve over time in that direction, but I don't think surface type is, it's, it's not available now and I don't think it's a first level priority for next iterations on, on the calculator. So um, we did have uh, 
uh, we did have two stone dust surfaces in, um, in the study. So one thing you can play with is if you want to, um, uh, to have a factor that includes that, um, those were in the Colorado location. So um, choose the factors that correspond to that region. All right. Thank you so much, Tracy. Well, it looks like we've reached the end of our scheduled time together. I want to thank everyone for their attendance and participation, and especially Tracy for providing some great content and sticking around to answer questions. I hope you found the presentation informative and useful for your work. Again, you'll be receiving a follow-up email shortly after this webinar with a link to the recorded version, a feedback survey, and contact information in case any of your questions went unanswered due to time constraints. With that being said, thanks again, everyone, for attending. We hope you join us for another webinar in the near future, and have a wonderful rest of your day.